All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6 to 11 and let's get it a whirl. So just some housekeeping items. Um, okay, so I'll just let me mention we have Amy um, on the Zoom, but communication may be um, in and out. So we're not sure what's going to happen with that. And Paul is in via telephone conference, so we'll do our best with that. Um, for votes, we're going to do roll call vote. So I'll just go down to member and you can say aye, nay, um, or abstain. And then um, for talking, if you guys, I can see all of you, obviously, except for Paul. I'm not sure what's with Amy, but if you could raise your hand, I'll make a note of who wants to speak and then I'll call on you. Because obviously, if we all start talking, we're going to talk over one another. Okay. Um, I think that's it for now. Okay. So let's do the consent agenda. Jim? Okay. Consent agenda is the uh, approval of regular meeting minutes from March 10th. We have um, an extension of a leave of absence for a teacher that was on leave for the current <clears throat> school year. She's extending it to December 31st of 2020. Uh, our monthly bills, <clears throat> and we have a returning family for homeschool, and that is it. Okay, so I need to pull the minutes because I wasn't there. So I'll pull the minutes of March 11th. Um, anybody have any comments, questions on the consent agenda? Carrie? I just have something to note on the bills and, and um, I'm not sure that it needs to be pulled. I just have a comment on it. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead with that. Yes. Okay, thank you. On page two of the bills for Barco products, just noting that the shipping is half the cost of the product. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure if this was like an emergency requirement and it required expediting shipping, um, but just noting it because shipping my bane. Yeah. Bob, can you speak on that? Yeah, I mean, I can look at it. I, I have a sense. I know what this is for. It's for the student who's in a loper. So she's a runner. So they, whenever she makes a mad dash, I think, Jim, you can confirm. I yeah. think it's, for, you know, the individual we're talking about. Yeah, so this was uh, expedited shipping because of a safety issue with the student. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is a motion to approve the consent agenda. Let's see meeting minutes of March 11th, March 10th. Donovan, so moved. Second. second. Okay, so we have a motion by Terry Donovan and a second by Cheryl Green. Okay, now I'll do the roll call vote. Um, number Commissioner? Aye. Member Donovan? Donovan, aye. Member Green? Aye. Uh, Member Gardner? No, I don't know if we're able to hear. Thumbs up. Yep, you got a thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up. <laughs> Good job, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Member McFadden? Aye. Okay, and I'm an I. Okay, so that motion carries. And then, if we can have a motion to approve the meeting minutes of March 10th. So moved. Donovan. Okay, so Lee made the motion. Terry seconded. Okay, member. Oh, sorry, uh, member Kissner. Aye. Sorry, all those in favor. Member Donovan. Donovan, aye. 
Member Green. Aye. Member Gardner. She wasn't present. Is she I think. abstaining? That looks oh, like she an wasn't abstain here either. Yeah, she yep. did not. Okay, so she's abstaining for, she was absent. Okay. Uh, Member McFadden. Aye. Okay. And then I'm abstaining. So two abstentions, Robin. Mm -hmm. Okay, motion carries. Okay, we have correspondence. Um, we have two resolutions from Portsmouth School Committee. We have capital project building meeting minutes. We have um, the West Branch Town Council, uh, their vote to support the school bond request. And I think that's it. Any questions on the correspondence? Everybody good? Okay. Okay, the 2020-21 budget. So I think we'll go to Jim or Bob, whoever wants to speak on that. And then I'll have Andrew speak on um, what's going on state regarding all referendums. Excuse me. Can you guys hear me? Excuse me, can you hear me? Go ahead. I'm having- I can hear you, Robin. Can you hear me? I'm having difficulty hearing you. You keep sounding weird. Well, I mean, I'm <laughs> going to shut off your video. Now. You know what? Let me put my other my other headphones back on. It's not your Want headphones. It's your one? internet connection. Let me shut okay. off your video, and that will probably improve your audio. Okay. Okay, so now we, you, we can probably hear you a little bit better. So I put lipstick on for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I said, <laughs> let's go to Jim or Bob um, to speak on the budget, and then we'll go to Andrew for um, what's going on in the state regarding uh, all the referendums and the process and whatnot. Was that better? Very, no, better. Yeah. Okay. So we um, we don't really have a lot more to report uh, because the all day referendum was scheduled for this week, and of course we didn't have the all day referendum. Um, we know that there has been some discussion at the state level. Uh, in fact, we even brought it up uh, on a conference call with the governor today about how school districts will finalize their budgets given the, the conditions that are in place uh, across the state and across the country. Um, I don't know, I, I don't have much else to say. I mean, we're, we're kind of stuck in the middle of school committee approval and waiting for the town to approve if that is the process that, that uh, we'll have to go through. So I have to hold the budget hearing. Yeah, so, so we're gonna, I'm gonna let Andrew speak on that. So, so, yep, so right now the League of Cities and Towns has um, written to the governor um, and asked um, basically for a, an advisory slash executive order um, dictating how this might look. Um, is it something where um, the towns would just be able to unilaterally set the budget? And they did this, by the way, on behalf of um, you know all cities and towns. The regional districts um, subsequently also submitted something to the governor asking basically the same question, but just making sure that the governor was aware that um, all the regional districts are somewhat unique in how they function, you know, one town, two towns, joint finance committee, um, all day referendum, joint town meeting, and just explaining to the governor um, that before she did anything, um, that we were hoping that she'd be cognizant of the potential difficulty that um, could ensue for regional districts specifically. Um, now, one thing that the League of Cities and Towns referenced, as did um, the regional districts, and I was, um, I, I did participate in at least the discussion um, on behalf of, of, of Exeter West Greenwich, um, Charahoe was involved, um, as was Foster Gloucester. 
is in Connecticut, their governor passed an executive order, essentially leaving it up to the regional school committee to, um, to set their budget. Um, one of the things we suggested just so, you know, and again, on behalf of all the regional districts was a similar, a similar mechanism to the Connecticut executive order. However, uh, making clear that no regional committee could, um, could set their budget at a rate higher than they had already notified um, the respective cities and towns. Again, none of this is binding. Um, I actually want to say, um, as my emails are popping up here, I've been out of um, out of the loop most of the day. Um, that I think the letter from the regional districts went to the governors just today. The letter from the cities and towns went about a week ago. Uh, but again, just sort of pointing out to the governor, hey, we need to address this. And please be cognizant when you do address it that regional districts have um, separate and distinct um, you know, needs and processes that we need to think through before we come up with a global order. Um, and so no, no, nothing right now. I can follow up today. Um, superintendents had a conference call or video call with the governor's office. So the governor was there, the commissioner, uh, Kevin Gallagher yep. is uh, her yep. like number one assistant there. So um, we brought this topic up. Um, many districts brought this topic up, and she asked Kevin to uh, to work on some kind of a resolution or an order or an opinion or whatever it is that would um, would would allow us to bring this issue to closure. So she's now received the letter from the League of Cities and Towns. She's received the documentation from the regional school districts. Yep. And she has directed Kevin to work on uh, the language that she should look at to kind of pass an order so that we can move forward. I'm, I'm, I'm relatively hopeful um, that she models something after Connecticut, because like I said, both uh, the League of Cities and Towns and the regional districts, at least, I don't know if it was brought up today, Jim, in your conference call, but they did reference, you know, sort of the Connecticut executive order as a potential yes. um, model or blueprint to, to move forward. So yes. we'll see. The important thing, I think, from our perspective was just that the governor was aware of the, the how the regional districts work, how they differ and how they work, um, and that a simple, hey, let, let a town council pass it wouldn't necessarily work for any of us because what would happen in Exeter, what would happen in West Fred, I, it just, we, we, you know, it was basically just more informational at this point in time. And it sounds from Jim like, um, uh, you know, Ke Kevin's a very knowledgeable guy. He he'll, he'll get all the information and then hopefully he can put something together that covers everything. Okay, good. Thank you. Any questions? Terry, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jim, have you heard anything in terms of any further reductions to the anticipated state aid? Uh, so that was a topic of conversation that worries everybody. Um, and the only thing that I have heard is uh, an update based on the March enrollment that was posted on the RIDE website just yesterday. Um, we did not see any further reductions. In fact, the, the reduction was lowered by a little bit. Um, okay. so that's good. <laughs> and then uh, Kevin was, was having uh, a pretty lengthy discussion with us on our call today about the, the money that is, has become and will become available to the states. Um, so there's money that's available through the packages that were passed at the uh, federally, right, for the COVID-19 situation that we're in. And uh, it seems that there are far fewer, at least according to the discussion, far fewer restrictions on how the money can be used. So he's hopeful that the stimulus money can be used to close the gap that exists in terms of revenue brought into the state, which would then allow us to move forward with uh, with budgets for our schools that are not impacted because the, the revenue is recovered through the, the stimulus money that's available. So that's kind of the, that's the story we got today. Now, have I seen anything in writing? No. Um, do I understand how many million hoops they have to go through to make that happen? I don't, um, but that's the direction that the governor's office is moving in. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Everybody's good? Okay. 
Okay, we'll go on to new business. Um, we have the Rhode Island Association of School Committee annual dues invoice for 20, 2020-21. So this is, this is annual um, and the, the vote is just uh, because the bill comes in early, uh, but it is for next school year. So it would not be paid until after July 1st in the new fiscal year. It is a budgeted ex expense. Hold it. Um, are we under new business? We're under new business. Um, A, 3A, the Association of School Committee annual dues invoice. Paul, are you good? Hold on. Okay, thanks. Okay. I lost Amy out of my view. I don't know if, if Jeremy oh, Amy is still connected. She's, still She's there? Yes, okay, I'm there. there. Okay. Um, okay, so if we can have a motion to approve the payment of $5,154 for the Rhode Island Association of School Committees 2021 dues invoice to be paid after July 1st, 2020. So moved. Donovan second. There's Kissinger motion, Donovan second. Any discussion? Okay, member Kissinger. Aye. Member Donovan. Donovan, aye. Member Green. Aye. Member Gardner. Okay, Amy's in nay. And member McFadden. Aye. And I'm an aye. Motion carries. Okay, item B, um, we have review and authorize acceptance of the proposal for the Champlin making virtual reality a realization grant agreement. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the uh, Champlin Grant this year. The Champlin Grant is available to middle schools and junior high schools only. <clears throat> the um, science department put together a virtual reality uh, program and grant proposal, which was included in the packet. Uh, it has been approved by our treasurer, which is the policy. Uh, and we just need school committee approval to move forward so that we can submit on behalf of the middle school. Any questions? Is there a dollar on associated with this? Yeah, it was yeah. on the it's on the paperwork, Paul. Ten thousand five hundred twenty nine dollars and fourteen cents. Thank 10, you. Five two nine fourteen. Second by Paul, you good? I am. Okay. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Got to read the motion here. Okay, so if we can have a motion to authorize acceptance of the proposal for the Champlin making virtual reality a realization grant agreement as reviewed and approved by the district treasurer. Member Kissinger. So moved. Member I'm Donovan. Okay. Um, Okay, roll call. I apologize. Member Kissinger. Aye. Member Donovan. Donovan, aye. Member Green. Aye. Member Gardner. Amy's an aye. Mm -hmm. Member McFadden. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> Okay, item 3C, we have the Eglier West Greenwich Regional School District Virtual Instruction Plan. Jim? Yep, so uh, in March, the, uh, the Rhode Island Department of Education required all school districts to submit the virtual instructional day plan, uh, which we've been implementing for the past four weeks now. Uh, and <clears throat> our plan, uh, actually, what we were required to submit is a distance learning plan. 
Um, we submitted a virtual instructional plan, which is a little bit different in that it involves a lot more detail and uh, there, are, there were several more sections that were required. Um, and we, we could submit our virtual plan in lieu of the distance plan, which is what we decided to do. The difference is that if our virtual instructional plan is approved, then we have the ability to waive up to three snow days per year, and that's based on the legislation that was passed um, a couple years back. So um, we thought that given the situation that we're currently in, and, uh, and we were committed to doing this to the best of our ability, that we were going to use this experience as an opportunity to prove that it could be done. So we move forward with the virtual instructional day plan, and it does require school committee approval as one of the steps before RIDE signs off on it. Um, they have reviewed it, and we got feedback in a couple of areas that, um, that we figured we would address uh, once we had four or five weeks of this under our belt, because we can learn from our experience to be able to address the questions that they had relative to our plan. Um, but overall, the feedback was quite positive. I think if we address a couple of small issues, have the votes that are required, um, then hopefully RIDE will approve it. And then going forward, when we have snow days, three of them can be done virtually and we don't have to worry about the makeup and the rescheduling of graduation and so on and so on and so on. So that's, that's why this is in front of you today. Okay, do we have any questions? Everybody's good. So Jim, we make the motion, are we we're gonna make the motion to approve the, the plan as recommended by the superintendent, even though you have some tweaks to make? Yes. Is that, is that okay? Yep. Okay. And then what I'll do is um, update the committee once it is resubmitted with, um, with the, it's really just adding information, some specific information. Like one of the questions has to do with multilingual learners. We have nine of them in our district, um, but we have to provide some additional detail. I know that our ELL teacher is is uh, spending a lot of time doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection with kids and families and it's working out really well. So all I really have to do is describe what we're currently doing and that will be the detail that Ryd is looking for. Uh, I can okay. update the committee on those, on those adjustments once we make them. Um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, when they get around to catching up with their business, they can approve this and we will move forward with a plan. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so if we can have a motion to approve the Exeter West Greenwich Regional School District virtual instruction plan as recommended by the superintendent. So moved. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, roll call vote, Member Kisker. Aye. Member Donovan? Donovan, aye. Member Green? Aye. Member Gardner? Amy's an aye. Member McFadden? Lost connection, abstention. Abstention. Paul had to abstain, he lost connection. And I'm an aye. So motion carries. <clears throat> okay, we have item D. We have the 2019-2020 school calendar, which needed some revisions. So the only revisions that were necessary, we did we did um, submit the revised calendar on February 25th, but when we moved to virtual instruction, which happened in uh, March. Uh, so March 16th became our spring break. And then uh, starting on the 23rd, we started virtual instruction. And the state, when they made the announcement for us to move to the distance learning model, they asked all uh, school districts to adopt a common calendar for the month of April. And the calendar uh, calls for, if you see in April, April 3rd, April 9th, and April 17th as um, 
they're calling them strategic pause days. And those are days for uh, teacher planning and, um, uh, and collaboration because this distance learning is, is a really new, um, really new experience for everybody. Uh, so I believe, uh, and, and one of the things that we have been advised is that this revision to the calendar needs to be approved by school committee. Um, I would expect based on some conversations that I had today um, that we will see distance learning extend beyond the month of April and into May. And if that happens, I anticipate that we'll see more strategic pause days. That, that's how the, they're referred to by the commissioner. Um, those days are not required to be made up by students. Uh, that was part of the, of the uh, order that was released by the governor and by the commissioner. So um, this basically just reflects the calendar that we have been asked to adopt by the governor's office and the commissioner uh, ride based on the fact that we're now in a distance learning program. Any questions? I probably have to, probably have to bring it back to you in May after the next <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so if we can have a motion to approve the revised 2019-20 school calendar as presented. Donovan, second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Member Kissinger? Aye. Member Donovan? Donovan, aye. Member Green? Aye. Member Gardner. Amy. She looks like she may have froze up. Oh yeah, she froze up. Okay. I guess Robin make a note that Member Gardner, uh, we lost communication. Okay. Member McFadden. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. I didn't hear Paul. Paul said aye. aye. Okay. Okay, motion carries. Okay, we are on item 3E. We have the report of the results of the family survey regarding distance learning. Just to add a note, Amy, uh, Amy said I. Oh, you heard her? Oh, yep. Actually, she chimed in on, a, um, on the, the group chat. Right. Sorry. Robin, can you reflect that? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Okay. You ready for me, Claudine? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you guys hear me? I'm gonna change my headphones. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we, um, at, at the end of our first week of distance learning, we sent out a survey to all families so that we could get some feedback on, uh, on how it was going and whether or not we had recommendations for, uh, for us to improve. So I just, uh, I just kind of produced this, uh, this quick overview of the results. Um, and you can see I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but you can see that we had uh, 536 responses, which represented exactly 900 students in the district. So it's a pretty good return rate. Um, and then I, I kind of put in blue highlight the, uh, the highlights of the, of the survey. So we can see that uh, in terms of rating the first week of virtual learning, we had 95% of the respondents who were at least satisfied and uh, roughly 78% of them answered with, the, with a score of four or five, so well or extremely well. Um, level of communication from the district and the schools, similar, 92.3% of respondents answered well or extremely well. Uh, another 5.6% were satisfied and uh, only 2% who were having some concerns relative to communication. So uh, very, very positive results. Uh, on the next page is the question about communicating effectively with teachers. Again, 88% answered well or extremely well and 97% of the respondents were satisfied. Um, I, I don't know that you can ask for better results than that. Um, we asked questions about understanding what uh, children are expected to do as part of their distance learning day. Remember, this was week one, so it was it was really new. 
Uh, and the overwhelming majority said, yes, they understand. Um, another quarter of them, 26.5%, um, had some understanding and a, a very small percentage uh, had no understanding at that point. Um, we asked questions about how much time children are spending on daily learning. We have made some uh, recommendations based on the feedback that we received, uh, and those recommendations are specific to grade levels. Uh, we also have a document that RIDE has produced since this survey that gives us some more guidance around expectations for length of time. Um, we asked questions about technology, and um, in week one, we had 83.3% of the people saying that the technology worked well or extremely well, and 97% of our families were at least satisfied. So uh, again, the biggest issue that I've heard across the state is connecting every family. We were at 97% in week one. Um, I will, a, a, a plug to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy actually helped produce this survey and send it out so that we could collect the information. He um, connected with every family that answered um, that they, they thought the technology was working poorly or it didn't work. Um, and since that time, we have distributed additional uh, computers to families. We secured uh, 10 hot most remote families so that we could help that get them connected. Um, and we did that before any of the uh, any of those things were available through the state. So unfortunately, we, didn't, we couldn't take advantage of what was free, but, um, but we did get the, the families connected to the maximum extent possible. So 97% in week one were satisfied. That has to be better now because we've connected uh, some of those 3% of the families uh, with, with additional devices and additional hotspots that we provided. Uh, so the, the technology challenges, same thing. If anybody expressed concern, Jeremy reached out and we've been addressing those problems on an individual basis. Um, I don't wanna go through all of the feedback, um, but I will just say a couple of things. The feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Most of the people that provided recommendations on improvement because we asked the question um, about, about providing us with any information that would help us to be better. <clears throat> Most of the families started with positive comments and then um, offered a, a bit of feedback that we should consider. So, um, so it looks like there's, you know, based on what I wrote, that there are an equal number of positive versus recommendation uh, in terms of feedback. That is not the case. It was overwhelmingly positive. But the feedback that we received I wanted to summarize and distribute to the teachers and the principals so they could engage their faculty in conversations about how parent feedback could be used to make some changes to our process. And that has happened. Um, I know the principals are uh, meeting with their staff just like we are meeting right now on a regular basis. They use the, this survey as uh, a basis for a, a pretty good conversation about how things went and how things can be better. Uh, and my message has been that we have to consider the circumstances of families um, because the longer this lasts, the more many of our families are going through. And things like giving an assignment in the morning and then having it due at three o'clock in the afternoon is not acceptable because many families still have working parents. And although the normal school day happens from nine o'clock to three o'clock or 8.30 to three o'clock um, in a distance learning program, we have to be more flexible and allow parents to be supportive when the parents are available to be supportive. And sometimes that's not between the hours of 8.30 and three o'clock. So we've made several of those kinds of adjustments in response to the recommendations that we receive from parents. Um, and we will send out another survey uh, so that we can get a sense of where they are four weeks into it um, at, towards the end of this week. So that's where we are. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of, uh, of the teachers and the administrators. They have risen to the occasion on this. It's, it's quite a remarkable feat, I think. Yeah, if I could follow up on a little bit of what Jim said, you know, the, we're averaging over, Metcalf is like Command Central when, you know, Jeremy and his team are fielding on a 24 hour cycle, the 
technology. So we're exchanging roughly between one to five Chromebooks a day. And it could be bad charger, device not functioning properly, or parents, uh, families need another device. And Jeremy and his team are handling that. Although Steve Bailey did get a call from an 11th grader because he's the maintenance director and she figured he could fix his computer. But <laughs> <laughs> that's well, we've got all these volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> but he forwarded that on and that's just getting better. And then the, uh, the grades pre-K through six, the classroom packets are just, uh, again, we're, we're handing those out on a daily basis. And the feedback at point of service is great. So really positive, pretty amazing. Are we keeping track of the uh, additional costs um, associated with this distance learning such that when this money becomes available and I know that they're, I know they haven't figured out how to distribute it yet, but I suspect that, you know, we, we've got, we're going to have to show some pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Jim, so, Jim go and ahead. Bob have been keeping track. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Ross uh, produced some documents for us before any of this really started to unfold. As soon as the, uh, the pandemic, well, as soon as we had, uh, we had a feeling that we were going to be moving in this direction. He, he uh, produced some documentation and went over it with all of the administrators and directors so that we could track um, expenses. Uh, and, you know, to the best of our ability, we'll be ready to, to prove whatever hardship we've faced financially. Uh, when right. The time is right. And, and just on that, you know, just, just documenting, Lee, to your point, the expenses. And then um, last week we set up, a, it's a portal. We're on the FEMA portal for Rhode Island. So it's just, they're gonna start to give us guidance. But sadly, you know, I think there's a, a theme you're hearing from the superintendent and then from, you know, the business administrators too, is like, you know, by the time it filters down to the schools, you know, it's just going to be a process, but we're documenting and we have the, the FEMA forms that we're using. So we're just staying positive on it. Bob, you had a, an issue. You spoke to me briefly about the summer lunch program. Is that the same number of participants as in the summer? How, how is that working again? So, so just um, this will go under the heading of feedback, I guess. Um, the survey, but the the real issue was that we are not a summer feeding program, an SFSP, a summer food service program. Um, we never were. We meet none of the criteria to set that up in Exeter West Greenwich. However, from the onset of March 13th until roughly the end of March, the Department of Ed and the USDA kept working at it, working at it, and then eventually they gave the waiver so that any district who wants to be a, a summer feeding uh, program can, can be one, so an SFSP. So that is now the designation which we're operating under, and we deliver on a daily basis about 160 meals to families, and we have 18 uh, meals that are picked up. So about 178 to 182 meals a day we're providing. Uh, so it's it's a it's pretty. You'd be impressed to see what we're doing. It's pretty heartwarming. So it's it's a good thing. So um, who participates from? Is it based on need, financial need? Um, initially it was when we first started um, it went out to um, it, well it, it should have been 50% of the participants needed to be free and reduced and we met that mark so it, so the email went to everybody uh, through our student information system so roughly 1752 uh, email addresses and said, you know, hey, this is the program and you're in, you know, just contact us fee and, you know, and, and, and we'll get you in line to get breakfast and lunch. We did that 
then in what we needed to do under the NSLP designation was to have 50% or more free and reduced. And we met that mark. Then they opened it up. Eventually they changed it. It took a couple of weeks to the um, SFSP, which is a summer feed uh, service program. And that's open to any individual, really anywhere, that's 18 years or younger can get a breakfast and lunch. And we pushed that onto the website and we did outreach to both towns, to the coordinators. I don't have their names in front of me, but they're doing the outreach to the people who they deal with. It's like a social services. If you said the name, Marge, I think is one of them. And then someone, I forget the other one from West Greenwich, but they're doing good. And, and, you know, we're going to, we keep getting, you know, it's a, little bit of word of mouth and i think as this goes along it's going to continue to grow but one of the things it does show is how prideful people are it really does people are not the folks that we're talking to we know that there are people who have children at home that should be taking advantage of this and we're just trying to get to them you know through the social media through the emails and through word of mouth so I anticipate it's going to continue to grow as it goes on. So, uh, pardon my confusion, and, and that's that's why you're here, Bob, to deal with me and my confusion. Is um, um, is it open to 17 all of the students of, in the district at this point? Yes, it's actually open to anybody who goes to the window is 18 years or younger. It doesn't matter what community you're from. We're now no longer able by USDA regulations you cannot ask for any sort of identification but being EWG everybody knows everybody so we know we know the families but we're we are very the only way we deliver quantity and address and when people come up it's quantity and uh, that's it so it's it's one of the most uh, you know liberal in a non-political sense way of a USDA program. In other words, you're 18 years or younger, you can, you can get a meal from any one of those sites. Okay, any, any other questions? Any other members? Terry? Um, Bob, how typical or atypical is it that the district delivers the meals for this many meals proportionately? Oh, it's, it's, it's pretty typical right now um, in different districts are doing, uh, it's based on their, what they have for a fleet. So we're currently using a couple of the minivans. Mm -hmm. We have two drivers and then we have the TAs doing the running. Uh, they do the delivery because the drivers can't drive and deliver. Um, but I know that, say like a Cranston, they own their own buses, so they're using buses left and right. I know some districts that, because they're in a different place with their transportation provider and they don't own them, they're using their own vans to do it. You know, their own fleet of vehicles. So it's a hodgepodge. And it's like everything, uh, Terry, it's morphing under our feet basically right. this is settled down thank goodness you know but pretty neat it's impressive Terry, if i could yeah go ahead Terry. um with regard to the report itself as far as the technology i know that um every staff member at every level every student every family is doing so much more and being asked to do so much more but I can't commend the IT department enough. I can't even imagine, I know Jeremy doesn't have a team of a thousand. Um, it's, it's just incredible how much has been put together so quickly and so fairly flawlessly. It's very impressive and I want to say thank you. Thanks, Terry. I did all that. And all our administrators, our superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, I said, Jim, I said, you know, I, I just, I don't, I never had a worry actually. I mean, what, 
you know, what we have in gym and our administrators, they did a phenomenal job. And I was on a chair committee, um, a chair committee meeting at the Association of School Committees. And there's just the amount of items that the school committee chairs have to think about and what they need to do um, between Jim and Andrew. Um, I, I really, they call me for, you know, if they have questions or comments, but I don't have anything to worry about. So we're, we're a very, very, very lucky school district. And um, we should all be really proud of our administrators and, um, and our legal counsel. Because I have to tell you, listening to those chairs, I don't know who the heck their legal counsel is, but it's not Andrew and it's not his firm. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I commend everybody. You guys are doing an awesome job and I haven't received one phone call. And if something was going wrong somewhere, I would have gotten a phone call, at least one, and I haven't gotten anything. So thank you. Um, okay, so I think we can move on to item F. We have the vendor contract discussion. Um, I don't know who wants to take the lead on this. Jim, Bob, Andrew, I'll just leave it all to the three of you. Um, I mean, I can start it if you want, Bob, Jim. Does that make sense or? Sure. Okay. Um, so you have, you have in your packet correspondence um, that I believe Bob read um, to the bus company, Ocean State Transit. Um, Bob alluded to this a little bit in, in um, his last few comments. I, I refer to it as sort of building a plane midair. Um, this, you know, things are moving and happening um, as we go and we're all trying to figure out what the best thing to do, what the most cost effective thing to do, what the legal thing to do is. Um, and transportation, um, I would say, Bob, especially probably over the last week, week and a half, has um, quickly percolated and risen um, to, to the forefront. Uh, issue being is that, um, you know, the bus companies understandably are approaching the districts and saying, hey, look, we've got contracts. You know, we didn't create this situation. We're asking that you, you continue to pay us, um, continue to pay our employees. It's good for the community. It's good for the state. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not being facetious. I understand that position completely. Um, conversely, you know, Bob was actually one of the first business managers to reach out to me and say, hey, what, what, what do we have here? Um, you know, this is a huge dollar um, amount. And, you know, are we legally obligated to pay this when school isn't in session? Um, dovetail that with the CARES Act, which had some language in there with respect to transportation and a desire um, for anyone who's going to receive whatever fund, federal funds there are to, to attempt to keep um, employees and contractors and their employees employed. Um, so the long and the short of it is, um, and then just let me back up just one second. And then I believe as recently as Friday night, Jim, if I'm not mistaken, the governor issued a memo uh, right. to the Association of School Superintendents that again, tried to sort of walk that, that, that fine line that we're all trying to walk, which is look, you, you have taxpayer dollars, transportation's a huge cost. You know, some districts are getting absolutely no service from transportation. Others are. And what the governor basically said is, I'm not ordering anything, but I'm asking you, you know, if you can keep the bus people um, employed to the extent that they're working and to the extent that they're employed by the bus company, that's our preference. But in no way, shape or form are we expecting you to be paying the bus company for a service you're not receiving. So dial that back. Um, and like I said, Bob was actually well ahead of the curve on this um, because the letter that he put together um, that you saw went out well before that guidance from the, from the governor. And basically what, what Bob had said to the bus company is, look, we've got language in our contract um, that we don't even really have to take an action. Uh, you know, it's, it's an act of God. You're not providing services. You're not liable to us for the services. We're not liable to pay you for the services. Um, and that's where we are. But Bob had reached out further um, to Ocean State um, and I think in, in compliance with the governor's request as well said, hey, look, if you want to talk about um, amending the contract to reflect any services you may be providing, I think Bob had mentioned, um, you know, that we have, we do have at least a bus or a bus or two that's delivering meals to, to students. Happy to pay for that. Happy to work with you folks with that. Um, but, what, you know, what do you think? Um, to my knowledge, and I'll let Bob weigh in on this, um, I don't believe we heard back from Ocean State Transit. Um, 
as to what they want to do. Um, long and short of it is, I think legally, per the contract, you're absolutely fine um, not paying them for any services you're not receiving. To the best of my knowledge, speaking with Bob, the only service you're currently receiving from these folks is um, that delivery of, of lunches and, 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 and the like. Um, so by offering to pay that, you're completely complying with, I think, the CARES Act. You're complying with what the governor has requested. Um, you're doing what's right by you know, the bus company as best you can. The other thing I, I, I just want to point out, because it's come up a number of times, and I believe this is the case with Ocean State. Uh, I know it's the case with First Student. Um, when this all happened, um, these bus companies laid off their drivers, understandably so. So I just want the committee to understand that while the, the directive or the, the request from the feds and the request from the governor is, hey, you know, to the extent we can keep these folks employed and off unemployment, let's try and do that. Hey, continuing to pay the bus companies at this point in time, to the best of my knowledge, is absolutely not going to do that. Drivers have been laid off. They're collecting unemployment. Um, to the extent that they are driving, districts are paying them. You guys are offering to pay. Um, so it's been my, you know, consistent legal position. I would not be paying with taxpayer dollars for a service that you are absolutely not required to pay for. And, you know, we've actually got good contract language in here that, that gives us that out, makes us not liable in this kind of a situation. We, we actually have a specific epidemic clause yeah. in there. It's, that's yeah. what, how often does that happen? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, you know, from a, from a legal perspective, there's specific language that answers the question, boom. Um, so we just wanted, you know, you folks to know and have the opportunity to weigh in because I also realize it's not just a legal issue. It's a political issue. There's constituents, there's taxpayer dollars. But my advice to you is, um, you know, Bob and Jim have been right on top of this from the beginning. Um, they've made all the right moves and all the right decisions. We've offered to talk to Ocean State Transit to amend the contract per the governor's request. If Ocean State declines to amend the contract, that's fine. You've got specific language that says, we've got an epidemic. We're not liable to you. You're not liable to us. Um, so, Andrew, there's, um, I have the letter from the governor's office in front of me. Yep. Um, it was written on April 10th, so I think I received it over the weekend. Yep, I, yeah, it's Friday night, Jim, you sent it to me. Yeah. I remember sitting on my couch. I was like, oh, here we go, nine o'clock. But I thought it would be, <laughs> I thought that the committee might want to just hear the key paragraph in the governor's letter. Uh, and it says, for services provided through a contract, for example, student transportation, as opposed to services provided directly by an LEA employee, the state recommends that contracts be amended rather than terminated to more accurately reflect the actual costs incurred during the duration of the public health emergency. The goal of these amendments should be to keep active employees engaged and employed to the greatest extent practicable while we are engaged in distance learning. And that language of keeping active employees engaged to the greatest extent practicable is right from the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. So the governor provided for us, based on our request, her guidance around, um, around contract employees because of the, the concern that was raised by the bus companies that if you don't pay us, you won't qualify for money through the CARES Act. And the governor clarified that in writing and sent it to us. So I think what we're suggesting based on all the conversations that the three, the three of us have had what we're suggesting is exactly what the governor has suggested we should be doing yeah. and is consistent with the cares act and would not then jeopardize our ability to collect money um, that we are we're eligible to receive based on expenses incurred during this during this pandemic and that's spot on jim and again i would point out just to, to sort of tip my cat to bob and jim You'll notice their letter was dated April 7th and the, the governor's guidance came out April 10th and they were directly in line um, with the thinking. So um, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a controversial topic. The federal funds issue sort of looms out there. Um, you know, but, but again, I think, I think what you guys are doing is directly in line with the intent of the CARES Act. It's directly in line with the request um, and suggestions by the governor. And I think it's the right way to deal with with the taxpayer dollar situation. Transportation is one of your biggest costs. And I just can't see, especially in your financial situation, 
continuing to pay a full bus contract when many of the drivers, if not all of them, are laid off anyway, and you're paying for a service you're not receiving. I'm making yeah. Sense. Okay. I just, do you have any buses, I just hope this bus is available in September when we send the kids back to school. Uh, and Lee, that's a that's a genuine concern. It's a real concern. Um, I've heard from the bus companies, um, and again, I don't think they're making this up. Hey, we laid these folks off. They're going to work for Amazon. They're going to work for you know BJ's Home Delivery. We may not get them back. That's that. I, I don't have an easy answer for that, Lee. All I can tell you is. Everyone's going to be in the same spot, and we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens. But for the record, they laid off their employees week one yeah. before any discussions took place with with us. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that what we're doing is wrong. My concern is, you know, the bus companies of anybody has a lot of overhead sitting there, and hopefully they were smart and they got in line for money from the CARES Act because there's some money available. But as of today, there is no more money available. So if they didn't get in line, they're in trouble. And if there's no buses available in September, then the state's in trouble. It'll be interesting. I, I would just add, you know, on that. So the, you know, the language, the paragraph that Jim read we must be working together too long now, Jim, because I highlighted the same paragraph. <laughs> part, of that, part of that paragraph also addresses, like Cranston owns their own bus fleet. I think North Kingston owns their, mm -hmm. or so, a portion of their own bus fleet. So part of that was, you know, asking the districts if, if their direct pay employees keep them going. In this instance, as the superintendent said, as soon as, the uh, wheels were put in motion on March 13th. Ocean State laid off all their workers. Scott and uh, Lynn, who are the uh, the managers, they're still working, and then they're the ones driving the two minivans. Uh, and again, like Andrew said, you know, we're I, I think that we're on a on a prudent course. Let's just walk. The the thing that I've had. Uh, in discussing with Jim and the support of Andrew is just asking Ocean State, what's your ask? You know, what's, what is your ask? Because we have contract language that says we don't have to pay. And, you know, without going too far down that road, I've asked them for, you know, give me a breakout of your fixed cost. You know, if your labor is already taken care of, and they said that's probably 50% of the cost of the contract. Uh, take out the fuel, maybe that's another 10 to 12%. You know, start talking about what is the ask going to be? And I'm a little concerned that they haven't asked for anything. <laughs> you know, that's, so that tells me maybe they're doing something at the corporate level, Lee. You know, maybe they're, STA who owns Ocean State is doing something different, uh, you know, trying to get in on that CARES Act. But at the end of the day, we can, there's, there's a couple of things that I'm just trying to keep my focus on. And one is we have two buses running. Let's continue those running. Uh, we'll pay as we should. And that's, that's it. If they haven't asked, they've got to put it in writing. And they haven't done that yet. And I suspect actually some of that's tied to this this uh, memorandum for the governor. I know that that the bus company lobby was pushing hard um, for something that that came out of Connecticut, where the governor issued an executive order saying, "Hey, school departments, you have to pay not only your staff, but you've got to pay all vendors and contractors, including bus companies." So I suspect that you know Ocean State for a student was hoping for something like that. And I, I, I believe, you know, I hope that Bob will be hearing from them soon because once that letter came out on the 10th, I think the governor, you know, made pretty clear, hey, look, you know, we, we, we'll, we want to help you. We want you to keep your people employed, but we're not going to simply give a, a bunch of money for a service not provided and for folks who are already on unemployment and the like. Um, so let's be creative. Um, you know, like Bob mentioned earlier with the DAs, we have them delivering lunch. A lot of districts are doing that. You're using your contracted staff in unique ways to keep them paid, but also to, to obtain a benefit. Um, and right now that's other than the lunch delivery, there's just no benefit to be obtained, which 
I mean, that's, that's just what it is. I, I can report that, you know, Scott and Lynn, they're tasked with, they're, they're running the fleet. So the fleet is running, they're, they're rotating out there, each driving, you know, they go back and they'll, after they do their deliveries, they're driving, you know, 10 of the buses today. So they'll, you know, they each take five, you know, and drive around for a few miles and then park them the next day. They'll take the next 10 and drive those around. And so they're, they're, you know, there is, you can't let the fleet sit, sit idle without, you know, bad things starting to happen. Um, but again, without an ask, I think we just follow what Andrew has laid out, what the governor has laid out through, uh, you know, that was Kevin Gallagher who wrote that. And then the ride, uh, who is it, John Catone, or he wrote Anthony, the letter. Yeah. Anthony, yeah. Yeah, I Catone should have mentioned that. Ride it. did the same thing. Ride, Ride was the first one, I think, to send out letters to, to first student and Ocean State saying we're not paying for anything. March 20th. Yep. So we hadn't even come up for air yet. The only thing I would just, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, you know, is what, what scares me, and they're, and they're playing it like a, you know, like a, you know, a card that they're holding, you know, is that when the lights get turned back on, there's no guarantee that the same bodies will be there. And that, that definitely means something to us, but we can't, we can't be held hostage to that argument, but we can't be naive to it either. Okay, Terry. So the governor's recommendation was to amend the contract as opposed to terminate. Correct. 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 So your amendment proposal would be what? Actually, what I, wrote, I, I wrote a motion if Andrew wants to listen and see if he thinks it's okay. So I have a motion to amend the, not that we're taking a vote right now, but just Andrew, if you can check this. Yep. Motion to amend the district's contract with Ocean State Transit to pay for actual services rendered during the public health emergency and until such time as Rhode Island public schools are reopened to students. This is retroactive to March 13th, 2020. And I got that from one of Bob's letters for the date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that's fine. And and to Bob's point, if perhaps um, you know through discussions, um, keeping in mind his concern and Lee's concern about you know having buses to drive kids in September, if that needs to get tweaked a little bit, we can always bring it back to you. But I think that 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 that's the intent of CARES. That's what the governor has suggested: is is keep people working to the extent you can. But I think the governor was very clear. Um, but that doesn't mean you know paying your, your, your usual monthly payment when you're not getting the service. That's not a good use of funds in this, in this, this, this terrible time we're in. So I, I, I'm fine with the motion from a legal perspective. And like I said, I think the only thing I would caution is Bob may want a little bit more wiggle room depending on his conversations with, um, with Ocean State, but that's always something they could bring back to you afterwards. And yeah, we, I, we've got no indication from Ocean <laughs> State they're willing to amend the contract. I don't think you have to terminate the contract. The contract says you're not liable for services you don't receive in an in a epidemic. I, I would not recommend terminating because then that gives them all the cards because then we have to bid. We'd have to bid and then they're, they've made no bones about it that they on all the upcoming bids, they're gonna have to make up what is probably a $20 million loss unless they capture it in a different way through some of the stimulus money right. that's available. Right. But I think there's no need for us to terminate. No. And, I, and just, again, you know, uh, not to belabor it, when I finished, I talked to them uh, prior to uh, leaving the office today and said, you know, this could just become a monthly agenda item as things continue to change. Yeah. So, Bob, um the last sentence of the motion, I, I got that date, March 13th, out of your, your letter. I'm assuming Correct. you want it retroactive to March 13th because that's when we started the yep. amended services. Okay. Correct. Yep. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, I, I do not see Amy or Paul. Jeremy, do you see do you have them still connected? No, I believe dropped off about 20 minutes ago. Okay. All right. So should I read my motion again? Probably wouldn't hurt. Okay. Um, motion to amend the district's contract with Ocean State Transit to 
to pay for actual services rendered during the public health emergency and until such time as Rhode Island public schools are reopened to students. I, I, the only thing I would qualify there, Courtney, is the motion to offer to amend. Because if they don't want to do the amendment, then, as I said, you're protected by the current contract language. But I think offering to, to make that amendment um, is, is perfectly um, acceptable. Okay. So, Robin, if you just insert a motion to offer to amend in the beginning. Okay. And then um, this is retroactive to March 13th, 2020. Just, just out of curiosity, just a question. Why are we doing any? I mean, I get to ever see a contract that doesn't have force majeure clause. That's what's going on. Why don't we just leave it alone? But the reason, Lee, I think is, is, is number one, um, in an effort to sort of preserve, well, a couple of things. An effort to preserve the relationship with the bus company to the extent we can. The governor has requested that we ask for an amendment to, to sort of quantify. And as a lawyer, I always would rather have something in writing where they say to us, hey, look, we acknowledge that during COVID-19, we're not going to come looking to you for any money for services not provided. We, we want to try and tie up things as much as we can. But in the same vein, you know, give them some assurances that we'll continue to work with them. Um, and again, this is just a request to amend. That's what the governor had asked. If, if, if they don't want to amend, they don't have to. We don't have to do anything. We just don't pay them. No, I, I, I heard that before. It's just, I just don't understand why, you know. All right, fine, whatever. Go ahead, Terry. What funding is changing hands now with the limited services that is being provided? I don't know that we've gotten a bill yet. No, we haven't. We haven't and, and Lee, that's money. kind of why I wanted the motion on the table. Um, again, no, no disrespect to the transportation company. Everyone's doing what they have to to pay the bills now. But I didn't want this to be in a situation where all of a sudden, you know, Jim and Bob are looking at a bill for, you know, the, the entire nut saying, okay, you owe us $20,000 for this month. Um, you know, we, we, we never I said we'd give you it. a break. I wish that was it, Andrew. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that would make the discussion easier, Jim. I'm sorry. But yeah, I, I, that's why I think I want to try and get ahead of this and just make it clear now. Now, Bob will be able to send them something that says, hey, look, the committee is once again offering to amend this. But absent any amendment, you know, be clear, we've invoked this this contract clause and we're not paying for anything we haven't received. I think I think it also makes it clear that we don't want to terminate. Um, we have a good contract with the bus company. So it, it, it shows that we want to actually amend the contract and not terminate it. Yeah, well, they'll, they'll hold those cards in because as, as force majeure works for us, it works for them. Well, Lee, don't forget, it wasn't too long ago that first student used that exact kind of language with Providence when they had the strike and Providence was trying to, you know, force transportation and, and first student said, hey, well, you know, force majeure, we've got a strike, we don't have to provide anything and there's nothing you can do. So it, it's contract language and in this particular instance, it benefits you folks, so you'd be crazy not to take advantage of it. Yeah, I'm not defending them. I'm just concerned that in September, if they pull out, you know, because they're bankrupt, and, uh, you know, and I don't take much stock in what our governor says, by the way. <laughs> I think she's a little bit loony. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, the bottom line here is, uh, you know, we could have a major problem in September. And that's, Lee, that's the key. I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you you're wrong. You've got two players, essentially, in Rhode Island as it is anyway, right? Ocean State and First Student. Yep. So even if it's still the same two, as I, I forget whether it was Bob or, or Jim pointed out, yeah, if they, you know, they're going to be looking to make up this loss like everybody else is <laughs> on, 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 you know what I mean? Every vendor... You know, I, I, I'd be interested, not interested, I'd be scared to see what all the different vendor costs are this time next year for all the different related services. Because everybody's going to be, be, go, be in a position to try and make back what they lost here. Now, there's any way around that. And, and you're even in a worse situation with the bus companies, Lee, because there are only a couple of players in town. Yeah, I understand that. Yep. Mm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I have to make a little modification, Robin. So I didn't want to be the one to make the motion. <laughs> so um, if someone could, so I asserted the language. If somebody could actually make the motion, you don't have to reread it. 
You say so moved? Yep. Okay, so moved. Do we have a second? Donovan, second. Okay, um, let's see. Member Kissinger. Aye. Member Donovan. Donovan, aye. Member Green. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you for everyone on that. Excellent. Okay, um, let's see. So we're on item um, section 4A, unfinished business. Do you have anything for the capital project? Update, bond discussion that anybody wants to talk about? Just, um, I think people are aware that the Exeter Town Council voted to approve uh, or to, to give us the permission to move forward with the um, with the bond, the capital bond, uh, West Greenwich was the first to do it. Exeter did it last week. And um, I've been in contact with, with Cal uh, about getting the signature on a letter. Um, so that's, that's been uh, more than a year or two in the making. Um, and unfortunately at this point, there's not a lot of things that we can be doing uh, other than just kind of preparing for the next submittal to ride. Um, but, but that was a big deal for us last week when that, when that vote took place. Excellent. The, um, I, I can add, uh, I just didn't get to it today or over the past two days, but, um, so on the capital projects, we're moving ahead with the Wawaloom boiler and the um, Metcalf safety. The boiler is going to require a commissioning agent. The scope of that project and the cost of it, Ride is requiring the commissioning agent. Um, we've got three responses. I'm going to send those to Lee and to James Angie as the chair and vice chair and ask for a uh, a letter of intent to move forward because we need to engage the commissioning agent early in the process to get over the hurdles at ride because they're just requiring it now that the commissioning agent is on board at the beginning of the projects. EDS has been out there. They're the ones who did the HVAC. They're doing the uh, prelim preliminary work if beyond preliminary at this point on the Wawalum boiler. So, you know, we're looking ready to get that packet. I, I need to get a meeting with Ride and then I need to, uh, Lewis can finish putting the, uh, the bid packet together and that hitting the street, so. Who did we use last time, Bob, for uh, Lionel? We used, we used Turner. Uh, did they quote this one? Yeah, they did. They, they're not the lowest. They're only $200 higher, and that's really who I would be recommending. They did a really good job, and they were, they were like practitioners. They weren't, they weren't suit and tie guys, you know. They were, they were good. Yeah, no, I, I heard good things about them. That's why I asked. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that together, Lee, and send that over to you and James tomorrow, just so I can get an LOI out to them. Okay. Okay. Good on that. That's cool. Um, important dates and meetings. So um, this is our school committee meeting on April 28th. And that should do it. Oh, Terry, go ahead. Uh, just a, for a clarification, uh, apparently there has been some question about the um, percentage changes in the proposed budget to or the school committee adopted budget to the local contributions. My understanding is that it was within uh, the required limits, not including the debt service. Um, Jim, could you speak any further to that for clarification purposes? So um, basically um, a member of the school committee submitted a letter to the Exeter Town Council saying that the information that we sent out uh, in our mailing was inaccurate. Um, but that member was present during our discussion where uh, the, the um, increases were mentioned and then we had the discussion, Aubrey was present around re uh, 
not including debt service because the law um, the law says that debt service is can be eliminated from that percent increase. Um, so, you know, basically the, the letter that went out to the community was reflective of our discussion that we had at the school committee meeting. It's not the way that it was presented in a written document that was submitted to the Exeter Town Council. I have had a conversation with Cal um, and uh, he asked me to respond and I did verbally. Um, however, I have not seen a copy of the letter because it wasn't submitted to anybody in the school department before it was submitted to the town council. Mm -hmm. Um, so he is having the clerk send me the copy of the letter, um, at which point I will respond to the letter and make sure that I respond to everything that's in the letter. I'll, I'll run it by the school committee so that you can see um, the response, make sure it's consistent with our discussion, and then I will send that over to Cal as a, uh, and he's either going to put it on the agenda as a mm -hmm. discussion item or um, include it as a communication so that the uh, the record can be set straight um, at the at the Exeter Town Council. I understood that that they were hoping to follow up on that um, for their May meeting, so that would be the May fourth, I think. So yep. um, I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And I have the letter in front of me. I know the letter that went out to all the residents. I mean, it does. It, says less debt service expenses comma the fy21 school budget calls for a 3.77 percent increase to exeter and a 3.23 percent increase to west greenwich so our language is perfect um if they just need a clarification of that i don't know to me it doesn't need a clarification it says less debt service expenses but I mean, our letter was perfect, so I don't, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with the letter. So whatever Jim needs to answer there. Do you know if the if there was like a levy statement put in an ad in the newspaper that may have not contained as much detail? Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't know what was in the paper. Okay. I have that was the letter that went out to all the residents um, from the school committee from the school committee, yep. And I believe, uh, and again, I have not seen the actual document that was submitted to the town council, but I believe that the letter suggested that what we sent out to residents was okay. inaccurate. Okay. And so, um, so it requires our clarification because mm -hmm. it's the reputation of the school department and the school committee that was called to question. Mm -hmm. And um, so we need to straighten out that, that issue which is easy to do, given that we had a public conversation about it, a lengthy public conversation about it before the vote was taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Every, you're welcome. Everybody else is good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we can have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. I'll just, we don't do roll call vote. Everybody in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank night. You. Take care, everyone. Thank Have a good you. night. Thank Thanks you. Well done. Yep, very Excellent. well done. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.